Hello folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studio with another Watchman video broadcast, part three. Fire falling down from heaven. Let's go back to our source here, Revelation chapter 13, verse 13. There's something there. Think of um, uh, Genesis 13, 13 with 13 words in it, talking about the men of Sodom. That shows you the wickedness. Here you have the man of sin. The son of perdition in Revelation 13, you have the false prophet. Acts chapter 13, you have a false prophet. Deuteronomy 13, we're warned about false prophets. There's a connection here. Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. 13 words that all is connected and interlaced here. But let's look at what we're looking at here. This is the false prophet. Revelation chapter 13, another beast that rises up out of the earth. And he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. He's making fire to come down from heaven. So we've spent the last two uh, broadcasts dealing with identifying exactly what that fire was. And here's, here's where we landed. Psalm 105 verse 32. He gave them hail for rain and flaming fire in their land. And then Psalm 104, verse 4, who maketh his angels spirits, his ministers a flaming fire. Same thing here. I think the Bible is connecting these two ideas that in the typology of what happened in the land of Egypt when Israel was being held in bondage was that God sent, God sent fire down from heaven. And it's a fire that consumed all of his enemies, and but God's people were in the land of Goshen, and there was no hail fire falling down upon them. Very, very important to remember here. God had protected his people through the fire. Keep that in mind. But then he identifies what this flaming fire was. It's his angels, his spirits, his ministers. They are flaming fire. So here's, here's what I see. I see the false prophet now calling fire down from heaven. He's acting like Elijah, which is what Elijah did. And I think Revelation chapter 12, the dragon has his tail around one third of the stars. And stars are what? What is our sun? Our sun is a star. And what does it do? It burns. So, so far, we're dead on here. He takes the star, even if they're asteroids or meteorites, what happens? When they hit Earth's atmosphere, what happens to them? They turn to ice? Do they turn to peanut butter and jelly sandwiches? I just made that up. They turn to fire. So the false prophet is calling, I think, I think that this coincides with Revelation 12, the dragon taking one third of his angels and them falling from heaven and they are fire. And remember, all of these false prophets that are already doing that, Rodney Howard Brown calling fire down from heaven. It's like he's showing you what the false prophet is going to do word for word. The Joel's army crowd, where they're going to be Joel's mighty army and they're going to burn everything up in the path and leave it nothing but ashes. And they'll say, well, we did God's work then, didn't we? So we're understanding here that this, this fire down from heaven are these fallen angels that are coming down. There is going to be a baptism of fire. And I think that these fallen angels, these evil spirits that side with Lucifer the dragon in that war cast down to the earth, taking over the earth and literally turning it into the kingdom of Satan and the kingdom of Antichrist himself. Now here's something that we're going to look at. We're going to add some things together here. Some studies that I've done from the mystery writers, Albert Pike and Manley Hall and others. Things about the Zohar and Kabbalah and the New Age movement. They're all talking about how the ascended masters are going to come down upon us and give us what? Illumination. That's what fire does. Candle is fire. Illumination. Lamps burning. Did you catch that? Watch this. Job chapter 41, God describes Leviathan. Leviathan is the dragon beast, all right? What, and, 
And all these stories about fire-breathing dragons, I don't think they're made up. According to the Bible, Jer uh, Job 41, verse 1, Canst thou draw out Leviathan with an hook, or his tongue with a cord which thou lettest down? Look at verse 19. He's going to describe what Leviathan is able to do. Out of his mouth, think about it. What is it that comes out of our mouth? Out of his mouth go burning lamps, and sparks of a fire leap out. Out of his nostrils goeth smoke, as out of a seething pot or cauldron. Witches always use a cauldron. His breath kindleth, think about what Amazon sells, his breath kindleth coals, and a flame goeth out of his mouth. They're going to get fire from heaven, all right, and it's going to be strange fire. We're going to look at that. They're going to get fire from heaven, all right. Here's the dragon, Leviathan, and out of his mouth. Why out of his mouth? Where's the poison of a serpent at? It's in his mouth. And the Bible, we've covered this. The Bible's teaching you that the words of false teachers and false prophets going out of their mouth is nothing but pure poison. It's the vine of Sodom. So likewise, here we have Leviathan, that dragon, that fiery breathing dragon, literally has coming out of his mouth sparks that ignite things on fire. Are you, are you catching this? Think about the apostles on the day of Pentecost. What was the words coming out of their mouth symbolized as? Cloven tongues of fire. There's two types of fire in the Bible. And we're going to examine, we're going to show you the difference here. Because you might say, well, you know, God says, you know, that he's a consuming fire and his word is like a fire. I get that. We're going to contrast both of these. But I want you to think right now of what this could mean. These angels coming down with sparks coming out of their mouth, which is false doctrine, false teaching, words that transform people. Words like in a secret book, which is what Manly Hall, uh, Albert Pike talks about, the lost word of Freemason. We're going to look at all that stuff, all right? So think about a time when the dragon spoke. The first time it ever happened. Genesis chapter 3. What was it that comes out of his mouth? Sparks. And in the Kabbalah, everybody, I'll show you that in a minute. I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go to the scriptures because I got a lot to show you today. Genesis chapter 3. Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Then he says, Ye shall not surely die. For God, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Those are the exact words spoken by Leviathan. Those, I believe, are the sparks that go out of his mouth that turn things into a flame. Because, and, and there's people with various ideas about, you know, who Cain was, and they say, well, the, you know, the serpent had sex with Eve and all this stuff. And I don't believe that because the Bible doesn't say that. King James doesn't say it. Here's what we know for a fact the dragon did. He spoke, and his words were sparks like burning lamps coming out. Thy word is a lamp into my feet. Get it? It's the opposite. His words coming out into Eve were sparks. 46 of those words in the King James. 46 chromosomes where our DNA is. And in Jeremiah 51, God tells Jeremiah to take all the curses and write them in a book and, cast, and bind a stone to them and cast them into the sea. So in that same word, even I would say in our DNA, there's something in there that represents a curse. And I think the sparks of Leviathan went out of his mouth. The words that he spoke to Eve went into her. And she passed those on to Cain and Abel and Seth. And Seth passed it on down the line to Noah and to his three sons, who then spread it out all over the, according to Genesis 10, the 72 families that are on the earth. All right? There's that number 72 again. I still haven't done that video yet, but it's coming. I promise you. So I want you to kind of think along with me here. Think of the words that the dragon spoke to Eve in the Garden of Eden as the sparks that went out of his mouth. So let's look at the Jewish Kabbalah. The Kabbalah is where we get the idea of the divine spark or the spark of divinity. It teaches, and I'm going to show you a quote here in a little bit, it teaches that everybody in the world 
And if you've never read any books on Kabbalah, all you have to do is watch Bruce Almighty, the uh, movie with uh, Jim uh, Carrey and Morgan Freeman. Morgan Freeman's God. I want to stop right here. Morgan Freeman is involved in I don't know how many movie and film and documentary projects that is his voice and his characterizations are leading this world right into the arms of the Antichrist. This guy stuns me. He was in Lucy talking about how man is going to evolve and all. I mean, just he's everywhere with this stuff. But here is um, Morgan Freeman in Bruce Almighty telling Jim Carrey, I almost said Jim Staley, Kent Jim Carrey, that every human has a spark of the divine in them. And it's awaiting a time when the spark ignites a full flame of divinity. What he's basically teaching you is, is that everybody is going to be a God one of these days. And that is exactly, word for word, what the dragon, the serpent, spoke to Eve in the Garden of Eden. So you see the spark thing here, the divine spark. Uh, uh, Michelangelo's painting of God giving life to Adam. We know in the Bible that God breathed into Adam and man became a living soul. In Michelangelo's picture painting, you don't see God blowing air on Adam. You see him doing this. You know what that is? It's a spark. It's giving him the spark of divinity. Think of, um, think of E.T. and how the extraterrestrial fell down from heaven and gave, uh, who was it, Elliot, the spark of the divine, the mark in his forehead. Um, I got I to gotta rehash this. I was going through old notes in my mind was I was putting this together because I remembered that in the Kabbalah, they refer to that, that center point, this spark of divinity that's in everybody as the Zimzum. Don't even ask me what that means, all right? I forgot. But the Zimzum is the divine spark at the center point in everybody's being. Rob Bell, the apostate, quote-unquote, preacher, who's got his own show now with Oprah Winfrey or something like that. I haven't followed it much. The former pastor of Mars Hill Church. Him and his wife wrote a book called The Zimzum of love, a new way of like marriage and relationships. And what the Zimzum is, is the divine spark that's in everybody. And the idea is, is that when Yahweh and the, and the Sephiroth tree of life and Shekinah, his girlfriend, they bring their sparks together and it erupts into a flame of divinity. And Rob Bell is teaching you sex magic in his books on marriage and relationships. This man is an apostate, no doubt in my mind whatsoever, leading millions of people astray. And you see this thing about a spark everywhere. On churches, churches use it. Spark, ignite a world of discovery. Spark, ignite, fuel, inspire. ABC spark, spark, igniting global change. Sparks, the start of something new. Here we go, here's a church group probably a youth group, called Spark, and they have 2 Timothy 1.6. Let's do this. Let's take out our King James Bible, and I want you to open your Bible, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 6, because I'm going to show you. Now, if you don't have a King James, I'm going to show you the difference, that there is a major difference between the King James and other translations. You're going to see something, and if God gives you awareness, you'll go, I never saw that before. And hopefully, hopefully you'll believe what I know to be true. This Bible is right. Second, I'm in 2 Thessalonians. Hang on. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Look in your Bible. Open it up. Make a note here. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 6. The Bible says, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. That's what the King James says. Think of a, think of a pot of stew or soup, all right? Or think of a, um, I don't know, just think of a pot of stew or soup. And it's been, it's been cooking all day and we're, we wanna taste it. We wanna see if it's done, if it's ready or not, right? If we have the right spices in it. We don't just take a spoon and just dip off the top, why? 
It's because we know automatically that a lot of the flavors of this stew or this soup is settled to the bottom. So what do we do? We stir that up and get it going, okay? And now I don't believe in rituals in, in stirring things up. You know what I think the best stir stick in the world is? You're looking at it right here, the Word of God. I think when we read God's Word, God stirs up things in us and we're, He makes us ready to serve Him and he, he brings out of us those gifts that He has given to us by His Word. So it says here plainly, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God. But notice all these spark, this spark logo here, 2 Timothy 1.6, it's got a different idea. What does spark and flames have to do with stirring up? Well, let's look at some of the other translations, shall we? And see what they say. The English Standard Version. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God. New English Translation. Because of this, I remind you to rekindle God's gift. NIV. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God. Holman Standard Bible, which is the Southern Baptist. Therefore, I remind you to keep ablaze the gift of God that is in you. The Mess Edge Bible. And the special gift of ministry you received when I laid hands on you and prayed, keep that ablaze. That's, that's where that church got it from. They didn't get it from the King James. If they would stuck with the King James, then they would have a like a soup ladle or a wooden spoon or something like that. But no, they don't have that. They're talking about a divine spark that's in them that they want to... F How do you get a fire going? It only takes a spark to get a fire going. Remember that song? That's how it is with God's love. I think this stuff's been creeping in for a long time, don't you? They want you to take that divine spark and fan the flame so that a flame erupts in you and you're on fire. Now you're the, now you're the, the burning man. I got that coming up. All right, that's why I said it. Walmart. Sam Walton dies, and Walmart takes a new direction. Walmart is on the forefront of global marketing, global finance, global everything, and there is no doubt in my mind that a spirit that works in the children of disobedience is working through Walmart. There, I used, you know, you started seeing their logo, which is three little sun rays, and somebody sent me an email and they said, Pastor Mike, do you know what Walmart calls its logo? They call it the spark. And look at it, it's got like six rays, three on top, three on the bottom. That's sons of God, daughters of men together. Walmart save money, live better. Walmart spark shop. They even, my wife asked me, we went into Walmart the other day and it said Walmart voodoo. And Lisa said, what is that? I looked at it for a minute, and it's one of these little HDMI devices that you plug into your, the side of your flat panel TV that connects to your Wi-Fi, and it downloads all these movies and videos and everything like that. Amazon has one. Google has one. Everybody's coming out with one, all right? You plug this little device in, and you can get all this streaming video from the Internet, and Walmart calls their little streaming device the voodoo spark. Voodoo. Like pagan witchcraft from Haiti or Brazil or something like that, where they're practicing warlock and necromancy and witchcraft and wizardry and sorcery and things like that. That's what that's where Walmart has, has gone. That's what they've turned into. Feeding into the minds of people the idea that we all have a spark in us and they want you to think six for some reason or another, right? We all have this spark of the divine in us and we're gonna help fan that spark into a full flame of divinity. There's a uh, documentary I saw on Netflix about a year ago and it's called Spark, A Burning Man Story. And the burning man is basically this hedonistic festival that they have out in uh, the desert in Nevada. Hundreds of thousands of people come and everybody is swaying to the music and they're beating the drums and they're walking around naked and they're 
they're fornicating everywhere, and oh, by the way, they have built an image. And the ritual that they have every year is that they light this image of a man on fire, and they call it the burning man, and they worship this burning image of a man. They're worshiping the Antichrist himself, Shiva, who's surrounded by a circle of flames, a ring of fire, as it were, okay? Here's what uh, the Kabbalah says about this divine spark. I want you to get a hold of this now and listen to this. In the beginning, there was only Ein Sof, God as infinity. As Ein Sof began to unfold, I to say that again. As Ein Sof began to unfold, a ray of light was channeled, think about that, into the vacuum through vessels. Some less translucent vessels could not withstand the power of the light and shattered. Most of the light returned to the infinite source. Think of Neo in the third Matrix movie going, being returned to the source. But the rest fell as sparks along the shattered vessels and became entrapped in the material universe. Our task, watch this now. Think of, let me stop right here. Think of these sparks now as little pieces of the Antichrist. God who said that he took his enemy and dashed him in pieces and scattered him everywhere. Everybody in the world has got this little thing on the inside of us, on the inside of our flesh. It's very wicked. It's very evil, isn't it? Okay. Paul called it in Romans 7 that he said, I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth, think of that word, it lives inside of there, dwelleth no good thing. And that no good thing is in each one of us as a spark out of the dragon's mouth waiting for it to all everybody to be joined back together so the burning man can live once again our task is to liberate these sparks and restore them to divinity that's what this spark is the ein, the ein sof of the kabbalah is none other than the beast the antichrist that rises up out of the pit when they open the pit, there's flames and smoke as of a great furnace coming out. That's where he is. The Ein Sof is the Antichrist. Ein Sof, the infinite God, has no static, definable form. Neither does Shiva, by the way. Instead, the Kabbalists conceive God, the world, and humanity as evolving together through and thus embodying a number of distinct stages and aspects with later stages opposing, but at the same time encompassing earlier ones. Think of that graphic. Let me pull it up here. We go back to this image of uh, the Ein Sof or the divine spark. And you've got the divine spark and it's circled by all these other things in there. It means it's way down deep in layers. All right. So let's go back and, and look at it again. Later stages opposing, but at the same time encompassing earlier ones. The Kabbalist God is both perfectly simple and infinitely complex, which means that he's opposites. Nothing and everything, hidden and revealed, reality and illusion, creator of man and created by man. Dun, dun, dun. Think about it. Remember in Revelation 17, John said the beast that was and is not and yet is. That's what this is describing. The beast that is and is not at the same time. He is hidden revealed. He is reality and illusion. He is the creator of man and was created by man. Think about it. Nothing whatsoever. I in. The totality of being, the infinite will, thought and wisdom, the embodiment of all value and significance, and the wedding of male and female, and ultimately the union of all contradictions. Are you kidding me? Like light and darkness contradict one another. Truth and lies contradict one another. Males and females contradict one, one another. You see what I'm saying? Atheists and Christians contradict. And here's what they're saying. They're saying that the Ein Sof, they're the God of Jews right now. 
they do not worship the same God as we people. They have been turned over to Baal. And their God is the union of opposites, sons of God, daughters of men, iron and miry clay f coming together, the union of male and female. That's sacred marriage, like in the Mormon temple, the square and the compass. That's the Ein Sof. That's the spark. Think about now mankind on the earth. And he has this spark of divinity in him, but he needs something the union with the divine to bring out a full flame of divinity within himself. So these divine beings up in the heavens as flaming fires are being cast down to the earth. They're falling down, fire literally falling down from heaven and encompassing mankind. Now, now the flame's going to come out, isn't it? Literally a baptism of fire. And I've got Baphomet up there. Because he is Ein Sof. He is the union of all contradictions, male and female, man and beast, man and angel, up and down, heaven and earth together. All right? That's who he is. Now watch this. The name Baphomet. I forgot about this. The name Baphomet. You know what it means? Watch this. Baphomet signifies Befe. Metios, which is Greek, the baptism of Metis, or baptism of fire, or the Gnostic baptism, an enlightening of the mind, which, however, was interpreted by Ophites in an obscene sense as fleshly union. And that comes from Wikipedia. Notice what's at the head of Baphomet himself. A burning lamp, a torch. A divine flame. And notice the two horns sticking out going in opposite directions. That represents yin and yang, male and female, left and right. That represents future and ancient being joined together to form the divine flame. Baphomet literally means a baptism of fire. But it's not the fire of the Word of God. It's a different fire. It comes out of a different mouth. You follow me so far? There is coming to this world a baptism of fire that is going to transfer. Think of, the, think of the symbolism of the phoenix. The symbolism of the phoenix is the phoenix dies and is resurrected by what? The flames of fire. Okay? I think this false prophet calling down fire from heaven I think the world at that time is going to get a baptism of fire from these evil angels that come down from heaven. Look at now, again, let's, let's look at the Bible and see what Christ said. We're going to understand the difference between false fire, strange fire, and God's fire. We're going to see what it is. Instead of just saying, well, they said, you know, fire down from heaven, and that's, you know, God said that that's what he was. Let's understand how it works so we'll see the difference. Matthew 3.11, Jesus said, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And he means it. Isaiah 30, verse 27, Behold. The name of the Lord cometh from far, burning with his anger, and the burden thereof is heavy. His lips are full of indignation, and his tongue as a devouring fire. Notice this, his tongue. Jeremiah 5, 14. Wherefore, thus saith the Lord God of hosts, because ye speak this word, behold, I will make my words in thy mouth fire, and this people would, and it shall devour them. Notice that the fire of, the true fire of God is words, his lips. Jeremiah 23, 29, is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. So let's illustrate this. Let's, let's understand what this means. When he said that he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with what? Fire. If you haven't seen this yet, two Pastor Mike Online live broadcast, four hours of showing you that the, the menorah in the wilderness tabernacle with the seven candlesticks in it, the seven lamps, those are fire, right? That fire was light. 
It was not like burning everybody. Every high priest that went in didn't fall on the candles and burn himself up. And everybody said, ooh, that's the Holy Ghost. Yes, amen, hallelujah. That's not how it happened. The candlesticks were the illumination. That was the light. And they were fed by seven pipes, which are the seven spirits of God. Revelation 4, Isaiah chapter 11. And a dear sweet lady sent this to me. Those pipes where the oil came from to light the lights were decorated with an almond, a knop or a bud, and a flower. And there was three ornaments on each pipe on the six pipes that came out the right and the left. There was four in the middle, an almond, a knop, and a flower. When you add up three times three and then three times four, because there's four on the center pipe, you get exactly 66 decorations on that. I love that. You get 66 decorations on that menorah that feeds the light. Yes, that menorah is represented as the Holy Ghost, the light. But it's also the Word of God as well. His, thy Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The, God's real fire illuminates so we are baptized with the Holy Ghost and with, is not my word as a fire? Jesus, Jesus himself, in Ephesians chapter 5, what did Paul say? He's talking about Christ in the church. And Christ washes his bride in water by the word of God. You want a baptism of, of God's fire? You got 66 books right here that'll do it for you. Man, I love that. That is so, so just now think of it. Here's the, here's the real fire of God, which is a lamp to our feet. And we bathe ourselves in the word of God. Baptism. Here's strange fire. See the difference? Acts chapter 7, verse 30. And when 40 years were expired, this is Stephen describing to the, uh, to the elders of Israel why he preaches what he preaches. He said, when 40 years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a what? In a flame of fire in a bush. When Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight. And as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord came unto him. Do you see that? What is it that we know about that bush that was on fire? It wasn't being burnt. The bush wasn't withering and crackling and dying. No, there was a flame of fire in that bush and it was nothing but pure light. It was the angel of the Lord in a flame of fire. And here's God's voice coming out of that. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah, that makes sense now, doesn't it? Here's Acts chapter 2, verse 2. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. In Acts chapter 2, verse 11, it tells you what those tongues were. Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. They were preaching Bible verses. They were preaching the word, of, the word of God from the Holy Spirit. And it was like a lamp illuminating their souls. The, the apostles were not out there blowing fire on everybody, burning them alive. And they're going, oh, that's a revival. Hey, man, there's, look at there. They're saved. He's lighting on fire. They were illuminating their souls, and that's how people got saved. That's how, to this day, that's how people uh, understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's through the fire, the lamp, the light of the Spirit of God through the 66 books of the Word of God. Notice they were cloven, because in Psalm 29, 29 7, the Bible says, The voice of the Lord divideth the flames of fire. There it is right there. By the way, that phrase, voice of the Lord, is found 50 times in the King James Bible. And Pentecost was 50 days after Passover. Nah. That's got to be just an, an accident, right? A, a typo. No, that's the handiwork of God right there. God's given you illumination. Every time you read this book, God lights a fire, a candle, a light, a lamp, and He illuminates your soul. He gives you wisdom. He gives you understanding. He gives you things that you would have never gotten from this world. You can understand the secret of Freemasonry by reading this book because it's revealed by the light of, the, of God's Word where it's hidden in this stuff here. Here's Albert Pike. He, 
wrote 800 some odd pages, and I've read most of it, and he never, ever actually came out and said, this is our secret. God's Word tells you. It illuminates it. Oh, I love this. Now, so the fire that um, Rodney Howard Brown, the drunk, the fire that he's calling down from heaven is not a fire that he wants. There was a video, and I didn't catch this until I was reviewing the video after I recorded the program of uh, one of these false prophets going down to South America somewhere and bringing this fire down on everybody. And there was a young lady, and I just almost wept when I saw her. She was under the influence of a burning fire spirit. You go back and watch it. She was doing her hands like this <laughs> and trying to blow on her hands. Why? Because she literally felt that her hands were on fire. And I just looked at that, and I just almost wept, and I shook my head, and I went, God, that's terrible. That's not God's Holy Spirit. That's a devil spirit that was catching this. This girl thought she was literally on. She ca you go watch it. She's trying to put the fire out. <sighs> she keeps blowing on her hands because they hurt so bad. And this false prophet devil wolf standing over her going, oh yeah, she's got it. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, false prophets are calling fire, consuming, devouring, burning, flaming, injuring fire upon people who are falling for it. So it's not a fire that illuminates. It's a fire that devours James chapter 3, famous chapter in the Bible on how wicked our tongue is because we use our tongue to form all of our words. James chapter 3 verse 5, even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Remember what the little horn does in the book of Daniel? It boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire of hell. And then he says in verse 8, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. He's telling you that false doctrine is this flame that's coming out of these false prophets' mouth. This false prophet in Revelation 13 calls fire down from heaven. Rodney Howard Brown, the drunk, calls fire down from heaven with his what? With his unruly member. Joyce Meyer, change your words, change your life. She is all, she is nothing but pure witchcraft. She is all about the power of the words that you speak set the course of your life. That's witchcraft, people. She says that your tongue is like God's tongue, and if you use it in a positive way to create, you can create your own reality. You can create your own world. You can create wealth. You can create health. You can, cre you can speak it and it comes into existence exactly the way God did in Genesis chapter 1. That's, that's blasphemy. It's witchcraft. And that tongue, witchcraft, says that you can't just think of what you want in witchcraft. You have to speak the spell in witchcraft. You have to use your tongue to say the right words. And that's part of what James was getting at. Our tongue is fire. And it sets the whole world on fire. They're the United Pentecostal, which don't believe in the Godhead, and they believe in work salvation because you have to speak in tongues in order to be saved. That's a little cult, what it is. Their publishing house is World of Flame Publishers. We're going to use our tongue, this unruly member, this world of iniquity, this thing that's full of poison, and we're going to set the entire world on fire and burn it all down, just like Joel's army. There is no discernment in this world whatsoever. You know why? They refuse to get the light from the candlestick of God through the 66 books. They refuse it. 
Leviticus 18, verse 21. Watch this now. Baptism of fire is coming, right? What was it that really that God specifically said? There's like nine things in Leviticus that he told them, don't do it. Don't be a necromancer like Perry Stone and Benny Hinn and these other people, uh, uh, the grave suckers from uh, the anti-Bethel church in Redding, California, Bill Johnson telling them to go to graves and get power from dead people. That's necromancy. God told him not to do that. And in Leviticus 18, 21, he said, Thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the what? The fire to Molech. Neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God. I am the Lord. God said, Don't let thy what? Seed. Your DNA. That it includes offspring too. That's what it is. That's what seed is in the Bible. It's DNA. Deuteronomy 18.10, Let there shall not be found among you any one that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch. 2 Kings 17.17, 17, And they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire, and use divination and enchantments, and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord, to provoke him to anger. 2 Kings chapter 21, verse 6, And he made his son pass through the fire, and observed times, and used enchantments, and dealt with familiar spirits and wizards. And he wrought much wickedness in the sight of the Lord, to provoke him to anger. That's Manasseh. By the way, if you go count, Manasseh did 13 things. And the 14th thing was, he put an, an image, a carved image, in the temple of God. But here, God's telling you over and over and over in the law, don't let your children pass through the fire unto Molech. Don't give your seed to pass through the fire. Don't do it. Baphomet, baptism of fire coming to this world. Fire, that fire is going to come down from heaven. Jeremiah 32, 35, And they built the high places of Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom. Let me stop right here very quickly. One of the Hebrew words for hell is Gehenna, which references the valley of the son of Hinnom. And the, the valley of the son of Hinnom is where they built fires unto Molech and made their children pass through the fire. So whether it's the Hebrew or the English, you still have a connection with not heavenly fire, hell fire. That's the connection. They caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire into Molech, which I commanded them not, neither came it into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. You know what God's saying here? Search my scriptures. I never one time tell anybody that they have to go through a fire tunnel. This is the anti-Bethel church. I call it, it's the other Bethel. Bethel Church, Redding, California, Bill Johnson's church, they actually have a ritual that they perform on everybody where these people line up on both sides and these other people will walk through what they call the fire tunnel. I, they are making their children pass through the fire unto Molech and God said, I never, that never entered my mind to make my people do that. That's not, if you, he's, you know he's saying? If you see that, that is not me. I didn't command them to do that. Bill Johnson is a liar. He is a false prophet that is making his people pass through the fire under Moloch. By the way, on the bottom left here is a picture of a guy laying at, at somebody's tombstone, and they've got their hands laid on it. You know what they're doing? They're grave sucking. They're practicing necromancy, worshiping false gods. And God said, I never, in fact, I told you not to do that. And these people did whatever the false prophet told them to voluntarily of their own free will. You see, I, I'm still sticking with this thing that nobody is ever going to get forced to take the mark of the beast. And it just makes sense when you see all of these people doing all these weird rituals and things that specifically God told them not to do, and they're doing that being led by the mouths of the dragon himself, flames of fire coming out of their mouths, the false doctrine coming out of their tongues, telling these people, this is what you do if you want to get closer to God. And they do it. Nobody makes them. They just do it. There's a picture in the Bible of a baptism of fire. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. That was their Hebrew name. 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And there was a falling away. You remember that? Because the king, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up an image, just like the false prophet causes everyone to uh, make an image to the beast and worship it. Nebuchadnezzar said, let's blow the trumpets, play the guitars, let's play the praise and worship music so that everybody falls. And when that music played, there was a falling away. And three young men who had decided that they were going to serve God and no other, they stood. And they told Neb, hey Neb, we believe our God is going to save us. But even if he doesn't, we're not bound to that. We're not going to fall. We'll lose our life before we do. So they heated it seven times hotter. I like that. And the flame was so hot that the, the soldiers who threw them in were burnt up. See it? They were burnt alive by the fire. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego inside that fiery furnace with who? Jesus. And God protected them and God kept them and God shielded them from the fire. They didn't burn up in there. They didn't catch on fire. The Bible says that when they came out, their clothes didn't even smell like smoke. You know, not like going into the gas station in the morning with everybody. <laughs> when you come out, you get, I'll, I'll get in the car and Lisa will say, did you light up in there? No, but everybody else did. They didn't even smell like smoke coming out of there. Because who were they with? The Son of God. And I asked a guy one time, he, he was defending his NIV Bible. And I asked him, I said, let me ask you a question. Who was in the fiery furnace with those three? And he said, Jesus was. I said, open your Bible and prove it. And he changed the subject. He realized that his Bible didn't say that it was Jesus, the Son of God, in that fiery furnace. So here we, here we go now. Here's the true fire. The King James says that it was the Son of God. Those of you living in Kenya, Moana wa Mungu, Moana wa Mungu, Son of God. That's who that was. I asked the good people in, in uh, Kilimabogo and, and uh, Migori, I asked them, who was, in, who was in there? And they said, Moana wa Mungu, the Son of God. Not the Moana wa Miungu. And they said, no, 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 not Son of God's, the Son of God. Miungu is God's, plural. Mungu is God. And I had them open up their Swahili Bible and read Daniel 3.25. And it said, Moana wa Miyungu. And their eyes lifted up and looked at me in stun. Pastor jumped up and said, I've been preaching out of the wrong book. God illuminated their souls that day. I'll never forget that as long as I live, what I saw. King James says, Son of God. New Living Testament says, like a God. NIV says, a son of the gods. ESV, a son of the gods. There's your strange fire right there. That's how you recognize it. That's how you spot it. That fire is a devouring flame that's going to burn this world. And it comes down from the heavens. False fire coming down from the heavens. There's actually, believe it or not, a god in mythology that is attributed as being the god that brought fire down from heaven to man. He's called Prometheus. Dun, dun, dun. We're gonna there was a movie. It's like the prequel to the Alien series, which I haven't watched all the Alien series. But I watched the prequel. It was called Prometheus, and you know what it was about. It was about the idea that mankind got on the earth by something that was done in the heavens, another world, and it was brought from the heavens down to the earth. That's why the filmmakers called it, I think it's a Ridley Scott movie or something like that, but anyway, that's why they called it Prometheus. It's the idea that Prometheus stole fire from Zeus. Mankind at that time, I guess, was just eating raw lizards or berries and cold coffee. And Prometheus stole fire and brought it down 
from heaven. And now they can eat fried chicken and donuts and all those good things that we heat up. Now man has fire. And, and the mythology is, is that Prometheus is the one, think of the false prophet, who causes and brings fire down from heaven. And he was punished for that because that's a bad thing. And everybody who studies this knows that it, it's not really fire fire like in a fireplace or on a stove. It's a cold illumination, the Gnostic baptism, Baphomet. That's what he brought down. Here's a statue of Prometheus with fire in his hand falling down from heaven at Rockefeller Plaza in New York City. Now you know what that is, don't you? That is a falling angel, flaming fire, falling down from heaven to the earth and bringing fire to the earth. You get it now, don't you? The Olympic flame. The Olympic flame is steeped in occultism. Now, I like sports and I love to watch the Olympics, but I'm telling you the rituals that they perform at these opening ceremonies are nothing more than occult-based rituals because every time the Olympic flame goes to light the Olympic torch, it always starts someplace. It doesn't start with some guy going, hey, you got a lighter? Yeah, I got to light this thing. I got to run a mile with this thing. Yeah, get, hey, yeah, hand me the, yeah, the matches are fine. You just light it. And, okay, I got it. That's not how they do it. You know how they do it? I looked at this and I went, I get it. Every year at Mount Olymp, or every whatever, four years, at Mount Olympus, they have a ritual. And they have this big solar mirror thing. And see this lady? She's holding the torch out in front of this solar mirror. You know what, you know what she's getting? She's getting the sun to light the Olympic torch. Literally, the Olympic torch is fire that came down from heaven. Dun, dun, dun. And in the 2008 Olympics in Beijing, China, they showed it. Here's a, a Chinese athlete, and he's on wires, and he's got the Olympic flame. They chose him to bring the Olympic flame. That's always a big ceremony thing. That Who's going to bring in the flame this time? And now it's this guy that nobody in America knows. But he's flying down from heaven with fire in his hand. And he lights, just like Prometheus, and he lights the Olympic torch. And the Olympic torch in Beijing was like, the, you got to go, you go watch this on YouTube. It was a scroll unrolling. Think about it. A divine flame coming down from heaven and igniting a spark in a book that's, or scroll that's rolled up. Dun, dun, dun. Manley Hall said this in Secret Teachings of All Ages. He said, commenting on Druid Priest, he said on the front of his belt, the arch druid wore a magic brooch or buckle in the center, which was a large white stone. To this was attributed the power of drawing the fire of the gods down from heaven at the priest's command. This specially cut stone was a burning glass by which the sun's rays were concentrated to light the altar fires. In Druidism, when they light their bonfires, they do so, their belief is that that, that fire comes down from heaven. Mm -mm -mm -mm. You remember Superman Returns? I watched it. I, used to, I grew up watching Superman. I loved Superman. In Superman Returns, remember, the story is, is that uh, in Superman 2, he made it with Lois Lane. So we have um, a god coming down from heaven, mating with a human woman. And then um, the story is in Superman Returns that he went, back to, he went back up to the heavens to Krypton. Krypton means secret. Cryptic. Crypt. A grave. He goes to the planet Krypton to find if there's anything left. He comes back five years later, and he sees Lois Lane, but she's got a kid that's five years old that looks a lot like Clark Kent. Just saying. And you find out through the movie that that child is a son of the gods and a, and a child of a human woman and a fallen god. 
But in Superman Returns, we have Lex Luthor, who is angry at Superman. You know why? And he has. Lex Luthor is given this little, he's on this boat, and he's given this little dramatic scene here. He's given a speech about Prometheus, and he's got an image of Prometheus in the background. And he said, Prometheus is the God who stole fire down from heaven. And he said that gods are dressed up in red capes and blue suits and have powers that they won't give to mankind. And Lex Luthor saw himself as Prometheus, the one who was going to give everybody the power of the gods. The flame, the fire coming down from heaven. Now, we're going to kind of change scenes a little bit. I want to take you in a direction and I want you to think about this, all right? Isaiah 9:18. The Bible says, For wickedness burneth as the fire, it shall devour the briars and thorns, and shall kindle in the thickets of the forest, and they shall mount up like the lifting up of smoke. In verse 19, he says, Through the wrath of the Lord of hosts is the land darkened, and the people shall be as the fuel of the fire. No man shall spare his brother. Now stop right here. If you compare Isaiah 9, 18 and 19 with Revelation 9, remember he mentions here that um, wickedness burneth as a fire, and it shall mount up like the lifting up of a smoke. Revelation 9 is the pit is open, and smoke out of a furnace is coming up out of it like it like comes out of a great furnace, a furnace of fire. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Think about it. Okay, and God says this is a judgment upon the wicked. And Isaiah 26:11. Uh, Lord, when thy hands is lifted up, or when thy hand is lifted up, they will not see. But they shall see and be ashamed for their envy at the people. Yea, the fire of thine enemies shall devour them. Isaiah 10, 17, the light of Israel shall be for a fire and his holy one for a flame, and it shall burn and devour his thorns and his briars in one day. Thorns, go study thorns in the Bible. Thorns are representative of the curse of sin. Thorns are represented uh, a representation of the Canaanites that were left in the land of Israel. And God said, they're going to be thorns unto you. Sons of Belial are called thorns in the Bible. Okay? And God says, this flame is going to come and burn up all these thorns. As, uh, Psalm 50, verse 3, Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous round about going to come before he does. Psalm 68, 2, as smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melteth before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. Psalm 83, 14, as the fire burneth the wood, and as the flame setteth the mountains on fire, so persecute them with thy tempest, and make them afraid with thy storm. Psalm 74, 7, they have cast fire into thy sanctuary. Stop right here. Remember the sanctuary, the tabernacle, the temple is this. My ribs are the 24 elders surrounding the throne. My heart with its four chambers are the four living creatures that, and a sea of glass, the pericardium. That's where God's throne is. And my two lungs are the Old and the New Testaments, the seven spirits of God through the 66 books of the Bible giving life and thunders and lightnings and voices. My voice box is here. My heart sounds like thunder and operates by electricity. This is the sanctuary, the tabernacle of God. And what did they do? They cast fire into the sanctuary. Um, Nadab and Abihu, does that sound familiar to you? Those are the two sons of Aaron, the high priest, who would have inherited the high priesthood from Aaron. But something they did disqualified and God killed them. You know what they did? Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. See, it right, right there, it's telling you what that strange fire is. The strange fire is a fire that is the absence of God's commandments. God's word. That's what the strange fire is. They brought this fire in. Rodney Howard Brown, Joel, uh, Joel's army, Todd Bentley, all of these other false prophets bringing fire, strange fire into the house of God. 
false doctrine, lies, mystery cults, drunkenness, you name it. That strange fire was the, look at it again, offered strange fire before the Lord which he commanded them not. That fire that they brought into the tabernacle was not the fire of the commandments or the words of God. It was the absence of it. That's why it was strange. And God killed them. God was dead serious about this thing, wasn't he? Isaiah 29, 6, Thou shalt be visited of the Lord of hosts with thunder and with earthquake and with great noise, with storm and tempest and the flame of devouring fire. Isaiah 43, 2, and I want you to look at this. And what I'm going to say probably going to mess with some people's eschatology. I respect that, but I have to look at the Word of God and leave it the way it says. So I want you to think about the possibility that before we leave out of here, we're kept through a fiery time. Isaiah 43, 2, think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and who they were with. They were with the Son of God that kept them from being burnt by the fire that they were in. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. 1 Corinthians 3, the Apostle Paul's telling us about the things that we're doing here on this earth. Some of them are going to be burned up one of these days. 1 Corinthians 3, 13, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. There are things that I do in life that are not totally dedicated to the ministry of the Word of God, which is gold and silver and precious things. Those things will endure the fire, but wood, hay, and stubble? Yeah, there's things in my life that I don't have totally dedicated to the Lord. That's true with every body, every Christian. Those, that wood, that hay, that stubble, that chaff, it's gonna get burned up one of these days. It's gonna be a waste. Psalm 57, 4, my soul is among lions, and I lie even among them that are set on fire, even the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows and their tongue a sharp sword. Think about it. My soul is among lions. Think of the roaring lion. Think of the devil. Think of uh, what the beast looks like, the appearance of a lion. Even the sons of men, and I'm among them that are set on fire like those that go through the fire tunnel. And we're among them. 2 Kings 2.11, And it came to pass as they still went on and talked that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Elijah is a picture of our rapture, our translation into heaven, having not seen death. And what was it that brought on this translation of Elijah into heaven? Horses of fire and chariots of fire, which are what? Angels. And a fire came down and separated those two. I do believe in a separation of Israel and the Gentiles. I just don't believe they're saved with two different gospels. Same gospel, same spirit. They just get a double portion of it. They get it better than we do, people. That's what the Bible says. But notice that before Elijah goes up into heaven by the whirlwind, fire came down. Now watch this. Last place, all right? I remember years ago when I started the Watch Me Broadcast, at the end of the Watch Me Broadcast, I was doing a Bible study, and then I split it off, which was, became the pure Bible study. And I was doing a study on the book of 1 Peter. I didn't know that that would really anger some people. Because I was teaching just plain, simple things out of the book of 1 Peter, and people were writing me saying, Pastor, please stop. Please stop doing that. Peter, 1 Peter's not written to us. It's written to Israel. It has no bearing on us whatsoever. It's not for us. It's for them. They're the ones that are going to have to suffer and do all that stuff. We're not. And I see that in no place in Scripture whatsoever. 
And I said, well, I, I don't see it in the Bible. Yeah, but go to these websites and read this guy's book and listen to this guy's teaching. No, I don't think so. I think I'll just read the Bible. And there's something in 1 Peter that there's some people that they don't like this. So they deny it. Let me read it to you. 1 Peter 1, 7, that the trial of your faith being more, much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be what? Tried with fire. Might be found unto praise and honor and glory. At what? At what event is the trial by fire going to happen? The appearing of Jesus Christ. That's why they were telling me not to do a Bible study of 1 Peter. Because they think that they don't get tried by fire at the appearing of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 4.12, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you, when his glory shall be revealed. There it is again. When his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. On their part he is evil spoken of. You know what that is? That's all those false Bibles saying that the guy that was in with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was a son of the gods like Prometheus was. They hate, they hate the real Jesus and they hate the real Bible. And twice now in Peter... This is why they were just flipping out of their minds, not wanting me to do a study on 1 Peter, because King James Bible believers don't believe that. And I'm just reading it. And twice now in the book of 1 Peter, you're told that at the appearing of Christ, there's going to be a fiery trial, which is going to try, and it's going to try our faith, not our works, our faith. Because some people who say they are in the faith it's going to be, be revealed by fire that they're not. But those who believe the Word of God as the Word of God, when the fiery trial comes, and let's be honest, there have been little fiery trials come to your life, hasn't there? And throughout every one of those, you come out on the other side saying, I still believe this book is true. I believe what God said. You know what he's doing? I think he's preparing you for that day. So what if, what if a day comes and there is a baptism of fire on the earth? How are you going to deal with that? I think it's wise to arm yourself with this in mind. Are you ready to face a fiery trial which is to try you. Are you ready to have your faith on trial? And while everything in your life that was vanity burneth and vanishes away, your faith and your trust in the Word of God still stands. After all, the Son of God in the fiery furnace is the Word of God in the fiery furnace something to think about, all right? I don't have all the answers, but neither does everybody else. Let's go back and read this book and let God, let those seven spirits, those seven candles with those 66 ornaments on there, let them give us light and illumination in this dark world we live in, all right? It's Pastor Mike here. I've enjoyed giving this. Thank you for listening. Hope is a blessing to you. Think Bible. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.